Well, tonight's topic is Revelation's eternal sign in Earth's last conflict. You know, when it comes to the question of the origin of life, you have basically two positions. One is, there is a God. The other one is, there isn't a God. Either God has always existed and brought about the creation of the entire cosmos, not just this earth, but the entire universe, or all of it just came about by simple chance. And as we look around nature and, and we study the amazing uh, complexity of even the simplest forms of life, we realize that God has left his fingertips all throughout the universe, from the smallest living organism to the amazing far reaches of outer space. I have to tell you one of the things that confounds my mind personally is to think of limitless space. I can think about it for just about as long as I've just said that sentence. And then it boggles my mind. God is limitless. The universe is limitless. I, I, I can't grasp it. But that's our God. A God that gives us evidence that he is the creator. A God that shaped the world. A God that fashioned this globe. Now, the book of Revelation describes a vision in which John was brought to the very throne of the all-powerful creator God. Here in this vision, in Revelation chapter 4, we find a clarion call, a bold call, for men and women living in Earth's last hour to return to the worship of the creator God turning people back to the true worship of God. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. So in this prophetic vision, John travels to the throne room of the universe. I mean, amazing. It's just fantastic. If you want to read another account, you can read one in Revelation uh, in Revelation 4, the, the whole chapter, you can read one in uh, Isaiah 6. Absolutely incredible, the throne room of God. And then he hears these sounds of praise. And Revelation 4 is magnificent in helping us understand, really, true worship. You are worthy, O Lord, verse 11, to receive glory and honor and power for, and here's the reason, you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. So all of heaven sings this magnificent song to the creator. Now, some scientists may not know how life arose or how the universe got here. But all of heaven knows because all the angels sing, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power because you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. So they weren't just created, but they exist. Our very breath and life this evening in the Warren Performing Arts Center is because God has given you that life. He nurtures it and he continues that life. We did not evolve out of some cosmic accident, but we were created by a loving, caring God created in his image. Now, before you existed, even in the womb of your mother, you existed in the mind of God. Uh, that, 
that's, that's a profound thought. God fashioned you. God shaped you. God created you. The book of Revelation calls humanity back to worshiping the Creator. Now, there's an answer to the question of human origins. It's found in the book of Revelation. It's part of his end time message for all people. Revelation calls us to, and here it is, in Revelation 14, magnificent chapter, verse 7, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. In an age of evolution and the preponderance of many individuals believing in evolution, God sends a message to the entire human race calling us to worship the Creator, not our own figment of imagination as to how we got here. No, this is a message for all of us. All of us here in this beautiful auditorium in the Performing Arts Center and those of you watching worldwide through live streaming. It's not a message for just one religious group or perhaps one other. It's, it's not a message for a denomination, just one or another. It's God's final call to his people to worship the Creator. Well, how do we worship the Creator of heaven and earth? And how does he remind us of this creative power? At creation, did he leave us a symbol, a reminder of what this special creative authority sign was? Revelation is the book of endings, all right? It's the last book in the New Testament and in the Bible itself. We can only understand the book of the endings if we understand the book of the beginnings. We'll only understand the significance of the monumental issue in today's world if we understand the events at creation. So Revelation's final call to the entire human race to worship this creator God, our creator God, has its origin in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, the book of beginnings. This theme of true worship, remembering the creator, is a common thread throughout the entire scripture. It's one of the most important themes of the Bible. The heart of Revelation's final crisis, and this is so important, the heart of Revelation's final crisis is over true or false worship. Worshiping the Creator is at the center of it all. So let's now return to our origin so we can understand our destiny. The amazingly intricate world as we know it today was created in six literal days. That's what I believe and that's what scripture teaches. Our creator spoke, just said it, and the earth came into existence. He dazzled it with light, and enveloped it with the atmosphere. He brightened it with babbling brooks and flowing rivers and colored it with beautiful flowers and plants. He enlivened it in a, in a variety of, of beautiful ways. Can you imagine the ingenuity and creativity of God, all the variety in the world? He spoke and it was done. Day by day, looking upon his handwork, that's over the six days now, he keeps saying, it is good. Now he wasn't really complimenting himself, he was just enjoying what his creative power had done. And then came the crowning act of creation, turning to the Father, 
The Creator said, Genesis chapter 1 and verses 26 and 27, let us, now that's a beautiful word right in there, that, that pronoun, let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You see, human beings, man could receive no greater honor. God could have shown no greater love. The human race is God's masterpiece of creation, the object of his absolute supreme love. After the creation of Adam and Eve on the sixth day, the Bible says in chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Just six days of work. And creation was done. Such a short time. But not for God. The account of creation is not over, though, on the sixth day. The second and third verses of chapter 2 indicate the following. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Now you might ask the question, God rested? I mean, was he tired? All he did was speak. And it happened, although with human beings he formed us out of the dust of the earth. That took a little effort, but that's not something to necessarily get tired about. It really was because he was pleased with his accomplishments over the earth's first six days. Then God did something especially significant. Let's look at this now in a very careful way. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Now the seventh day Sabbath, given at creation, was to be God's perpetual reminder of our roots, our origin. Now let's look at three specific things about the seventh day. Remarkable things, things that will shine out to us as we look at them. First of all, God blessed it. The Bible says God blessed the seventh day. He made the seventh day as an endless fountain of spiritual refreshing for his people for all time to come. Secondly, God sanctified it. That means he set it apart. When you sanctify something, when you when you place it in a unique relationship, you set it apart as a holy day, a special time, every seven days to continually remind you of your beginnings, your origin, where you came from, your roots, why you're here. Then thirdly, it says God rested on it. The Bible does not say that God blessed the first day, or the third day, or the fifth day, or any other day except the seventh day. Now that doesn't mean he doesn't like those other days. He made those other days. He used those other days. But he did something unique, something set apart on the seventh day. Now whatever God blesses, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 27, he blesses forever. So to bless, and this is important, to bless is to infuse something with God's very presence because 
it becomes holy because he is holy. God blessed the seventh day by making it an eternal sign of his powerful creation and his infinite love. He rested on the seventh day, not because he was tired, but because he knew you and I would be tired. God sanctified the seventh day. He set it apart for holy, unique adoration of him. Now the word sanctified, and, and this is gonna be an interesting uh, illustration. I really love this illustration. It's just so right to the point. The word sanctified is the word that's used by God for the marriage ceremony. And what a privilege it is to have a precious uh, husband or wife, a spouse. My, my wonderful wife, Nancy, I'm not going to embarrass her too much, but she's precious. And this is, the Lord has, has set us apart as a couple just as those of you who are married know. So this marriage ceremony is when one woman is set apart or sanctified for one man. That's the Bible, the Bible understanding. Now, here's this illustration, and I like it. Let's suppose a man gets married, and the woman he marries has Get this, six sisters. After the ceremony, the man is waiting in the car to head out on the honeymoon. One of the sisters of the one that he married slips in beside him in the car and tells him, now this is one of the sisters, she says, let's go. And he looks at her in absolute amazement and semi-horror, and he says, I didn't marry you, I married your sister. And her reply is, well, what difference does it make? I'm, I'm one in seven. Does it make any difference? It certainly makes a difference to the two who got married. There was one who was sanctified or set apart for him, and it wasn't that sister. All women are not the same. And I can say the same thing about men. And all days are not the same. Now the Sabbath was created, and this is important, 2,300 years before the existence of the Jewish race. Keep that in your mind. It was given to our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. The Sabbath was set aside at creation as an eternal symbol of God's creative power for his people in all ages. When Adam and Eve left the garden, the Sabbath remained as a reminder of God's eternal love. Exodus 16, we read the remarkable story of the falling of manna. Manna is that substance which God produced, fell from heaven every day, and it was to sustain the children of Israel in the wilderness. Where, the, where Mount Sinai is and the whole Sinai Peninsula, I've been there, I grew up in Egypt and Cairo myself, love Egypt and I love the Middle East, and it's very barren in the Sinai Desert. So God used this to provide food which they collected. In fact, the meaning of the word manna is, what is it? Well, let's go on to see what the Lord said in Exodus 16, 26. Six days you shall gather it, that's the manna, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. So God worked a miracle for Israel. He met their needs with this special manna that would fall from heaven. They would collect it every day. They would use it. They would cook it. They would uh, bake it, whatever it was. and it fell every day except Sabbath. 
if the Israelites gathered more than they could eat, the leftover portion would spoil. When some Israelites went out to gather manna on the Sabbath day, God said, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Well, on Mount Sinai, God wrote with his own finger on tables of stone the Sabbath commandment. He didn't write these commandments in the sand to be just washed away. He didn't write them on parchment to be consumed in some fire. God did not write the Sabbath command on a little piece of paper hidden in a corner. God wrote it on tables of stone. He wrote the law to endure forever. God didn't even entrust Moses to write it. Moses wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, but God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. Now let me ask you something. If the Bible, if in the Bible, there's only one set of laws written with God's own finger, if God wrote them on tables of stone, can we turn our backs on the eternal law of God written with his own finger? Well, the Bible says this, and this is the fourth commandment uh, in Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Let's read it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, we can keep holy only what God makes holy, all right? Human beings can't make things holy. God made the Sabbath day holy, and he blessed it at creation. He sanctified it. And so then he began that commandment with one word. What did it say? Remember. Why did God say to remember? Because he knew we would forget. In fact, it's the only commandment that says remember, starting out remember. He knew in an age of evolution, men and women would forget the Sabbath and their origins. So God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God is calling us back to an eternal sign of creation. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Now, notice he doesn't say a seventh day is the Sabbath. He says the seventh day is the Sabbath. And just as the day before your birthday and the day after your birthday do not commemorate the day you were born, the Sabbath is very specific. The first day, the third day, the fifth day, doesn't matter. They, they, they don't commemorate the birth of the earth by the Creator God. That's why we are to worship on the seventh day. Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, or blessed it, or made it apart, separated from the others. So the Ten Commandment law quotes Genesis and leads us back to when God created the earth. The Sabbath was never exclusively a day of worship or institution for the Jewish people. It was given for all humanity. You see, the Jewish nation was to be God's special emissaries and missionaries at the crossroads of the world, and they were to share this message with everyone. Just as the commandment says, thou shalt not kill, is not only for the Jews. Just as the commandment, 
thou shalt not worship any graven image is not only for the Jews. The Sabbath is not exclusively a Jewish Sabbath. It was given to our first parents long before the existence of the Jewish nation. It is for all New Testament and Old Testament believers, everyone combined. The Bible says the Sabbath was made for man, humanity everywhere. Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, I will bring to my holy mountain. Well, let's ask the question, what's God's holy mountain? What is that? It is the new Jerusalem, heaven. He says, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, I will bring to my holy mountain and make them, a joyful, make them joyful in my, my house of prayer. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. He says, all nations are one day going to worship around my throne in the New Jerusalem every Sabbath. Throughout the Old Testament, the Sabbath was God's everlasting sign for all his people. Ezekiel 20 and verse 12. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So the Sabbath is not only a sign that God created us, it's a sign that he can recreate in our hearts something new. When I come to worship him on the Sabbath day, I say, God, you are the all-powerful creator. You can recreate something new in my heart. God gave the Sabbath to Adam and Eve at creation. He gave the Sabbath to Moses in the Ten Commandment Law. He gave the Sabbath as a sign all through the Old Testament of his power to recreate hearts. He gave the Sabbath as a sign of his love to us and a symbol of his, his divine authority and his creative authority. But somebody might say, oh, come on, Pastor. What about the New Testament? <clears throat> what about Jesus Christ? Did Jesus come to do away with the Sabbath? Didn't he do that? I mean, did the disciples change the Sabbath? Did they worship on another day? Well, let's look at the New Testament. What did Jesus teach about the Bible Sabbath? Here's a marvelous text in Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, that's where he grew up, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, his habit, his intention, his activity, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So Jesus worshiped every Sabbath when he walked this earth. It was the Sabbath that he had created in the beginning. If Jesus wanted to leave another sign for us, another symbol of worship, wouldn't you expect him to leave us a positive example in his own life? You see, isn't it true that a, a person's will and testament is sealed by their death. You can't change a person's will after they die. And Christ's will and testament was sealed at his death. But the legacy of his life was, and we look at this again, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Indeed, Christ kept the Bible Sabbath. He himself said, Mark chapter 2, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Now, he doesn't say the Sabbath was made for 
only Jewish people. It's for Jewish people, yes, it's for everyone. The Sabbath was made for man. It was made for all humanity. The Sabbath was made for the Jews and Gentiles alike as a sign of God's creation and his ultimate authority. It's a sign that we worship him exclusively. It's a sign that we worship him supremely with all of our hearts. We were not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made as God's gift to us. Adam and Eve were made first. The Sabbath is God's gift to the human race. And Adam and Eve enjoyed that first Sabbath. Every Sabbath, we flee from the stresses of life to his palace in time. The tensions of life seem to evaporate because we don't work on the seventh day. The Sabbath is an eternal sign that he created us. We are to remember where we came from. Even in death, Jesus Christ kept the Sabbath. Jesus' closest followers rested according to the commandment. They wouldn't even embalm his body on the Sabbath day. Jesus rested on the Sabbath before he was resurrected on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Jesus kept the Sabbath in life. He kept the Sabbath in death. Jesus said, John 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. As we've already learned, love leads us to obedience. Love leads us to keep his precious commandments. Jesus told his disciples that even after his death, even after the crucifixion, even after the resurrection, they would be keeping the Sabbath. One day, Jesus gathered his disciples together and he discussed the coming destruction of Jerusalem in that mighty chapter 24 of Matthew. And in verse 20, it says, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Now, what sense would it have made for Jesus to say to his disciples, pray that your flight or your escape, your running away, would not be on the Sabbath if they weren't going to be keeping the Sabbath? It wouldn't have made any sense at all. Why did he say that? If they were all worshiping on the Sabbath together in one place and the Roman armies attacked the city, what would have happened? Well, the Roman armies would have destroyed them. Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, a terrible tragedy that took place. You can read about it and the events leading up to it. This was years after Jesus had already ascended to heaven. Now, some people might say, okay, Pastor, you, you know, you're, you're trying to make some logical sense out of all this. I understand that, but hasn't time been lost over the centuries? How can you know which day really is the seventh day Sabbath today? Well, there are at least three ways that we can know. First of all, you can know it from the Bible. That's what we've been doing so far. Secondly, you can know it from language. Thirdly, you can know it from astronomy. Now, you'll recall that the Sabbath was stated at creation and it was restated in the Ten Commandments given to Moses. Now, it's clear that there was no time lost between Adam and Moses. Why? Well, Adam kept the seventh day Sabbath and so did Moses. So all through the Old Testament, from Moses then, and certainly if people had not been keeping the right Sabbath when God gave the Ten Commandments written with his own finger, he would have corrected them. So you know that has to be accurate. Now from Moses to Jesus, God's people kept the Sabbath, and the Jewish people are very meticulous about these records. 
So there was no time lost then. The crucifixion story clearly reveals that the weekly cycle as we know it was not changed from Jesus' time until today. Now, let's look at the sequence of days from the Bible. We begin with the day Jesus died. The Bible describes it this way, Luke 23, and beginning with verse 54. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Let's ask this question. Were the closest followers of Jesus keeping the Sabbath after he died? What does it say? Yes. They rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. They did not believe that his death changed the commandment in any way. Now here we have three days listed in succession. The day of Christ's death, which was called preparation, that's Friday, the preparation day for the Sabbath. And then the Sabbath, according to the commandment, the seventh day. Then the Bible says, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them, and what did they do? They came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. So let's look at the order of those events. It's, it's really quite clear. You have three days. The preparation day, the day Christ died. And what day was that? Friday, preparation day. The next day, the Sabbath, the day he rested according to the commandment. And what day was that? Many people call it Saturday, the Sabbath day. And the next day, the first day of the week, when the women anointed his body. And what day was Jesus resurrected? First day, Sunday the first day of the week. The identity of the Sabbath is very clear from the sequence. Sabbath is the seventh day of the weekly cycle or the day many people call Saturday. Many Christians have said, but we worship on Sunday in honor of the resurrection. I want to tell you Christ has given us a symbol of the resurrection. How do we celebrate the resurrection? Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. So just as Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected, we do that by being baptized, by immersion. We come up from the symbolic watery grave to live the new life. Baptism in, is the New Testament symbol of the resurrection. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day. You honor him as creator by keeping the Bible Sabbath. Now this is very interesting. I'm sure many of you know different languages. In over 140 languages of the world, the word for the seventh day of the week is Sabbath. In Spanish, it's sabado, okay? Feliz sabado, happy Sabbath. In Russian, Ukrainian, Bulgarian, it's sabota. In Arabic, it's asabit. 
In all the cultures of the world, there is no question about this. When you look at languages, it's very plain. The word for the day in English we call Saturday is Sabbath. Now, according to such trustworthy sources as the Royal Greenwich Observatory in Greenwich, England, and the United States Naval Observatory, the weekly cycle has never changed. Jesus kept the Sabbath. Peter, James, John, Paul, other disciples, they kept the Sabbath. Acts 17, verses 1 and 2. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. So Paul preached about Christ. It was the Sabbath. The interesting thing is that some of the Gentiles were there. So, Acts 13, 42 says, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So here's Paul with the Gentiles, all right? These people aren't Jews. He's teaching them about Jesus. And the Bible says in Acts 13, verse 44, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Can you imagine a whole city coming together to praise and worship God? Praise be to God in heaven. I wish that the entire city of Indianapolis would be doing that, that every city around this country and throughout the world. If they did, there would be far less violence, far less tension, far less anger between people because God's presence would be with his people. You see, the Sabbath represents the harmony of the human race. In Christ, we are one humanity. And on Sabbath, we celebrate our oneness. When we come to worship him on Sabbath, he bonds us together as one common humanity. No more language barriers, racial barriers, economic barriers, social barriers. We are one in Jesus Christ. The disciples kept the Sabbath. Acts 16, verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. You see, in this city, there was no Sabbath-keeping church. So the Apostle Paul met with a group of believers by a quiet river to worship on the Sabbath day. In these last days of Earth's history, and I have to tell you, I believe with all my heart, we are nearing the coming of Jesus Christ. In these last days, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ that is being given to the world. Revelation calls us back to the true worship of God. But somebody says, well, <clears throat> I thought Christians now were to keep the Lord's day. Well, let's see what Revelation says. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Uh, someone says, oh, I keep the Lord's day. Well, wait a minute. Does this particular text, Revelation 1.10, tell you which day the Lord's day is? You see, human beings may try to define the Lord's day, but Jesus knows better. Let's let Jesus defined the words of the Lord's day. Matthew 12, verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Mark 2, 28. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Luke 6, 5. The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. 
Why do you think the Bible includes the same thing three times? Because it's important. Repetition helps us remember. And if the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath, then the Sabbath must be the Lord's day. You see, the Sabbath of the Creator God in Genesis is the Lord's day of revelation. It's the same Creator in Revelation as he was in Genesis. Just as he declared to the first inhabitants of the earth, I blessed, sanctified, and rested on the Sabbath. He calls all humanity, all of us, whether we're in Indianapolis or wherever you are watching right now, calls all of us to worship him in these end times. He does not change. Here are the last people on the earth. Revelation 14, 12. We quoted this text, I believe it was last night. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These are the last day people, the remnant, those who are at the end of time, who are turning themselves through the power of God back to God. They are people who keep the commandments of God, all the commandments, and the faith of Jesus. So now, the Sabbath, given at creation, given at Sinai, kept by his people, kept by Jesus, honored by the disciples, sign of God's power, kept on the new earth. Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23 say, for as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. So they'll come from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west. They'll come from China, from Russia, from Africa, from the Americas, from Europe, from around the world, they will come. And together, as one common humanity, together as brothers and sisters, as one family in Jesus Christ, we will come to give him praise, honor, and glory. Together, we'll come to praise the Christ who created the heavens and the earth. We'll come together with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll come together to praise Christ who died for us. Maybe you're thinking right now, you know, this is something new to me. I, I haven't really considered this before. But I know each of you has only one desire, and that is to follow Jesus and do his will. You see, even if it's of a different persuasion of popular opinion, even if it's different from conventional religion and its teachings, you want one thing only, and that is Bible truth. Your heart wants only one thing, Jesus, him crucified and risen again and coming soon. Charles, God leads. He brings us to the foot of the cross. Charles, come and sing to us that marvelous, wonderful song that will help us to understand that God leads his children.
in the right direction. Tonight, as you listen to this powerful message, how many of you would like to say, Lord, teach me, no matter what others may teach, teach me to follow you. I want to worship you as creator and Lord. And every week, I want to find that Sabbath rest. For me, the most important thing is to follow Jesus. As you listen to the song about Jesus leading us, may it help you to make the right decision, a decision of eternal consequences. God leads his dear children along. He will lead you, and he will always lead you to full Bible truth. How many of you tonight, <clears throat> even if this, <clears throat> excuse me, even if this may be a little new to you, you haven't thought about it enough, you haven't studied God's word, and I urge you to do it, but how many of you tonight would just like to signify to the Lord, Lord, I want you to lead me in full Bible truth. Could I see your hands tonight? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you recognizing that you have given us such amazing truth as to where we have come from. You created us. And you created a day in which we were to remember that you created us, to honor you because it was sanctified, set apart, holy, the seventh day Sabbath. Now, Lord, for some, it may be a new thought, a new understanding. Lead them along the pathway to full Bible truth and help them to understand fully what your holy word has said. Lord, we don't keep the Sabbath in order to gain extra points in heaven. We keep the Sabbath because you asked us to do that, and we love you, and we love to do what you say. So now, Lord, bless each one as they go home. Keep them safe and help them to ponder the things that they have heard tonight to fully understand that you love them with an everlasting love. And by remembering you on the seventh day Sabbath, you are saying, God, you have done everything for me. You have not only created me, but you can recreate in my own heart a new life and a new love for you. Bless each one and bring us back together on Friday evening as we focus upon your word in revelation of hope. Thank you for hearing us, and thank you for being our creator and for creating Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then blessing and sanctifying the seventh-day Sabbath. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.